Welcome back, everyone, to the front line with Joe and Joe. Joe Pasillo, as always, joined by Joe Resanello. And once more, dear brothers and sisters, let us go into the breach on the Veritas Catholic Radio Network, 1350 on your AM dial, 103.9 on your FM dial, spreading the truth of the Catholic faith to the New York City metropolitan area. Please be sure to download the app and share it with your friends, the Veritas app. You'll have access to all of our station's content, not just the front line with Joe and Joe. And Joe and I are growing nicely on uh, social media, particularly Rumble and X. We would ask for your continued support. We go live Thursday nights, 9 o'clock, where we get in a whole lot of trouble. Um, and that's why YouTube is probably ready to drop the hammer on us. But having said that, uh, if you wherever you see us, like, subscribe, share, uh, do all that fun stuff, help us out. So welcoming back to the program today, a friend of the show, Anthony Stefano. Anthony has a new book out. It is titled Christmas in Heaven. Now, you wouldn't think you're going into the breach if you're talking about Christmas in Heaven. However, this is the this is the front line with Joe and Joe. So that's exactly where we're going. Um, and the book, by the way, is available at Sophia Press. If you click the link in the description, uh, you will get a discount because you know Joe and Joe. Uh, so it's nice to save about 15%, particularly uh particularly given our current economic uh, economic state. So Christmas in Heaven, author is Anthony DiStefano, and the publisher is Sophia Press. So Anthony, for those of you who are not familiar, is an American author, television host, and activist. He's written five best-selling Christian books for adults, including A Travel Guide to Heaven and Ted, Ten Prayers God Always Says Yes To. He's also written 16 best-selling books for children, including The Donkey That No One Could Ride and Little Star. Anthony, welcome back to the front line with Joe and Joe, brother. Thank you for having me. Love being Absolutely. here. Absolutely. Our pleasure, brother. So I'm going to hand it over to Joe. We'll have a great conversation. We always begin with a prayer, Anthony, in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Amen. Remember, O most gracious Virgin Mary, never was it known that anyone who sought your help or sought your intercession was left unaided. Inspired by this confidence, we fly into you, a virgin of virgins, our mother. To you we come, for you we stand, sinful and sorrowful. O mother, the word incarnate, despise not our petitions, but in your clemency hear and answer us. Amen. Name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, Amen. Well, as Joe Pasil rightfully said, Anthony's written a number of books. He's written a lot of books on Christmas. Um, so I want to know why, Anthony. Is it the Galamad that makes you write these books? I mean, ultimately, <laughs> I know why, but but I mean, uh, Christmas is my favorite holiday. I love the season. It's my favorite day to eat. I love Christmas Eve. I always did my whole life. So uh, obviously we're commemorating the birth of Christ. That's why you're writing about it. But, you know, there's other days too. There, you know, like what's Christmas? Why? Is it special for you? It has to be. You know, I'm always interested in writing books about the true meaning of Christmas uh, because Christmas has been so secularized, almost beyond recognition. You know, there's been a concerted effort by the, uh, the secular society to hijack all our holiest Christian holidays, not just Christmas, but Easter, as you know, with the Easter bunny and, and even Halloween. Halloween is a deeply Christian ho holiday, all Hallows, all Hallows Eve and All Souls Day and All Saints Day. They try to hijack these uh, holidays and make them into almost pagan rituals. So in addition to loving Christmas and loving the magic of Christmas as everyone does and the food and the decorations and the lights and the family, you know, it's writing about the true meaning of Christmas is also my little way of trying to do my part to reclaim what's ours. You, you know, uh, just to jump in there, it's funny. Uh, before I was married, um, I got married later in life. I got married at 43 and uh, I would go to India. I, I used to go to uh, I used to work with Mother Teresa's nuns and I would go for Advent. And sometimes I'd come literally home like two days before Christmas, because if I miss Christmas, my parents would kill me. So I have to come home for Christmas. So I did. And I always did. And it was always interesting. I'd fly into Kennedy and sometimes I take public transportation, um, you know, through Port Authority, take the subway, the whole deal. And it was always like a stark, like difference. Like I would be in Calcutta, First of all, it's hot. I'm wearing flip flops. There's no Easter decorations. Everyone's poor. Um, it's completely non-commercial. And then all of a sudden I'd be like, boom, I'm in JFK. Boom, I'm in Port Authority. There's lights everywhere, trees, stores. I would always be like, wow, this is like, like it was, it was almost like being in a time machine. And I liked it. I liked the stripped down version of Christmas. Um, frankly, I never got to spend Christmas with the sisters there, but 
it, it was more of a truer sense of what Christmas was. Uh, I, I wanted to just throw that out there because I always felt like it was almost like shocking to me. Like when I would go from there and all of a sudden I'm like, I'm in Port Authority and Santa's like staring me in the face. And meanwhile, <laughs> like there was, you know, Jesus was in a manger. You know what I'm saying? Where like, oh, like no, I'll, I'll say this. I'll say this, that uh, I think there's a happy medium. <laughs> I don't think this, the, the pendulum doesn't have to go all the way to the strict stripped down version uh, we are celebrating something, obviously. It's a big celebration. The incarnation is the greatest thing to ever happen to humanity. It made the redemption possible. It made heaven possible. So there's a reason to have a party and great food and music and family and to get together and celebrate. Uh, it's good to do that. There's nothing wrong with that. But also when it when the pendulum swings to the other side, it's just as bad when you become commercialized and secularized so much that Christ is not in Christmas at all, and we don't even know why we're celebrating, uh, then of course that's an even greater evil. So, you know, that's something we could talk more about, uh, but keep, keeping Christ in Christmas, you know, sounds like a cliche kind of subject, but it's just as relevant today as ever before, more so than ever before. Absolutely, I agree with you. And for those of you non-Italians out there, what Joe said earlier about calamad, that's calamari, just to, just to you know, right. clarify <laughs> that we don't want anybody confused here. Mm -hmm. At the front line with Joe and Joe. Uh, as always, a pleasure being joined by Anthony DiStefano, prolific author of both adult books and children's books. His new book is out from Sophia Press, Christmas in Heaven. Um, and please buy it, but you can buy it elsewhere. Anthony, I'm sure it's available, Amazon, Barnes and Noble, and the whole nine yards. Uh, but we would really prefer you click the link in the description, buy the book from Sophia Press, and grab yourself a discount. But by all means, wherever you buy it, please buy it. So let's talk about. Christmas in Heaven. Let's talk about your book. And I'm going to give you the stage where you could kind of set, set up the story. Obviously, we don't want any spoilers. We want people to go out and buy the book. But the story is about a little boy, sad, right? His grandmother um, has passed away, has gone to her reward. Um, but, you know, so how to, what's the catalyst for the story? What's the inspiration for the story? Is it more personal to you? Um, so, so give us, yeah. give us some groundwork about, yeah. about the, the little boy and, and his grandmother. Sure, sure. It's not very, very personal to me. When I was a kid growing up in Brooklyn, you know, I didn't really understand why we gave gifts to each other. I didn't understand that concept. And I remember asking my dad about that when I was very young. And he explained it to me this way. He said it was Jesus's birthday. And since we couldn't give Jesus a physical present because Jesus was in heaven, you know, the best thing we could do is give gifts to each other because that's what made Jesus happiest. And that's a very easy concept for children to understand. You know, all kids understand birthdays and gift giving. And so from an early age, I knew that Christmas wasn't just the celebration of Jesus's birth. It was his birthday. And to a kid, that's a that's a different that's a, a big distinction. And that childhood idea led me a couple of years ago to asking myself, well, exactly how do they celebrate Jesus's birthday in heaven? We know as adults that there's great joy in heaven with the saints and the angels. But I think it's easier for kids to understand that celebration of joy in terms of a party. And the, and the way I made that into a story was by doing just what you just said. Uh, everything is better as a story for children. So I had this little boy who's sad because his grandmother died and it's Christmas time. And uh, he asked his grandfather, who is the husband of the woman who died, how is grandma doing in, 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 you know, right now at Christmas time? What is she doing? And, and the grandfather sits the boy on his knee and proceeds to paint a very consoling picture of the tremendous birthday party that's going on in heaven with all the angels and all the saints and our lady and our Lord. And of course, uh, uh, the, the boy's grandmother. So it's a way for me to, to tell the story of the true meaning of Christmas, but to do it in a slightly different way. I've written four or five other books on Christmas, and they're all about the nativity, the first Christmas, seen from the perspective of a, a star of Bethlehem or a grumpy old ox or a donkey. Uh, it was all about the nativity. This time, I wanted to tell the true meaning of Christmas from a slightly different point of view. And I did it because, you know, from the point of view that it's Jesus' birthday. Absolutely. Anthony DiStefano joining us here at the front line with Joe and Joe. Please go out and buy the book. Christmas in Heaven, available at Sophia Press. Click the link in the description, uh, and you'll get a discount for knowing Joe and Joe. Joe Resinello.
Uh, God has a sense of humor, Anthony. He has a sense of humor. He put Joe and I on Catholic uh, radio. Yeah, I, was, I didn't know you were going to say that. And that's exactly what went through my yeah, head. Yeah, so that, that, that proves has God has a we're, sense of humor. We're interviewing prolific authors like Anthony DeStefano and a couple of jamokes from <laughs> North Jersey. Go ahead, Joe. No, sorry but, to cut but, you But I off. say that because Italians also have a good sense of humor. I always think of John the 23rd, um, you know, like... He, he really was like a jovial guy. He was a smart guy, you know, and he was a holy man, but he also was very funny. Um, you put humor in this book, but it's a serious topic. I mean, it's the death of a boy's grandma at Christmas. How important is humor? I think humor is wonderful. It's a way to communicate a message uh, in, a, in, in a not so like rigid way, but you still get your message through. How'd you do it? Because that's kind of tough with a subject like this. Yeah, well, remember, I got into a sense of humor because I, just because I'm a guy from Brooklyn and how have I written 30 books? I mean, that's even funnier. Me, you know, you guys think you're funny having an interview show. I find it even funnier that I'm in front of the camera here. But anyway, yeah, yes, this is a serious book because it does involve death and grieving. Uh, but I wanted it to be a fun and a happy book, too, because ultimately the Christian view of life and death is extraordinarily optimistic. You know, we don't believe that death has the final word. We believe the final word is resurrection and life everlasting in heaven. So it was important for me uh, for this book to be positive and upbeat. And the way I accomplished it in this book is through the playful way we portrayed some of the saints. All the saints and the angels in this book are depicted doing things that they're famous for. And that has a humorous side. Because, you know, St. Martha, for instance, in this book is, is constantly cleaning and, 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 and sweeping and doing chores, just like she did in the Gospels. Uh, and St. Francis uh, comes barreling through the door, accompanied by a whole crowd of animals and cats and sheep and dogs and donkeys. And St. Martha is behind him trying to sweep because presumably they've, they've, the animals have left quite a mess. And, and we have St. Jude, the patron saint of miracles and hopeless causes, uh, helping out St. Martha with a, with a vacuum cleaner. So, so these are all rather lighthearted, playful depictions of the saints. And they're meant to bring a smile to the face of adults and children to help them deal with the more serious aspects of the book in a hopeful way. Because it's easier to talk about grieving if you're in a positive state of mind, as long as you don't trivialize the grieving. And I don't think I do that in this book. You know, I tell my atheist friends, the difference between uh, believers and non-believers non isn't that believers suffer and grieve less. It's that we suffer and grieve with hope. And one of the ways that we get this hope across is by, is by having a sense of humor. No, absolutely. And I'm glad you mentioned hope because a lot of times that, that like many things in our culture, Anthony, as you know, Anthony DiStefano joining us here at the front line with Joe and Joe, uh, hope's one of those words that gets thrown around, you know, hope, you know, when people say, well, I hope I hit the lottery and eh, not the same kind of hope that we're talking about. That's why it's a theological virtue. And I'm glad yeah. you mentioned that about atheists. That's why now, look, I have atheist friends, too, so I always try to go out of my way to not be insulting, even though I could be a little harsh when it comes to my atheist friends. Um, but I, I, you know, I don't hear I think that's one of our problems is that we don't we don't have hope. Joe and I were talking before you came on, Anthony. It's one of the things like going on out. Uh, we're obviously in a political season right now. OK. And, and every, what's going on out there? Why do people go so crazy and banging their head against the wall? Although all those political issues are important. It's because they don't have any hope. I really believe that. Joe really believes that. People have so little hope or no hope. That's why they put their trust in politicians or the government or this group or this movement or that movement. And it's all very empty to me. It's, it's, all, it's all just like I could never imagine existence without God. I mean, and we, we won't get into that. Whole, oh, I couldn't imagine like, like all the logical arguments, philosophical arguments. But one of the main things is uh, hope. Oh, I love your comments on that. I know it was a little bit of a rant. Well, Anthony. you know, and, and, but let me say, again, just like I said before, there's a there's a line that we as good Catholics especially walk. Uh, we don't do all or nothing. Uh, we, we, we do get involved in the political season because it's our obligation to fight against evil. And we have to fight evil wherever it is. Uh, and the reason we do that is because every single human being has dignity and value. And when we see them stomped down or killed in abortion or, or what have you, or the marriage trounced, uh, th th then we have to fight. But at the same time, 
we're called to be cheerful even when we're fighting. We're called to, called to have a smile on our face because we know that the final victory, victory is our starting point. We start by knowing the end of the story, which is that uh, life and resurrection and, and, and heaven. So we start with that and that, enable, that, that hope enables us to be uh, cheerful and, 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 and happy even as we're fighting seriously. Absolutely. Anthony DeStefano is joining us here at the front line with Joe and Joe. Please go out and buy his book. The book is Christmas in Heaven. It's available. Uh, Anthony, correct me if I'm wrong. So Amazon, Barnes & Noble, anywhere else outside of Sophia? Uh, you know, I always encourage people to patronize their local Catholic bookstores and Christian bookstores because these small mom and pop places, you know, they're, they're trying very hard to spread the word. So when you can, go to those stores as well. That's right. And and I was remiss. I should have mentioned that because, again, this is this is a children's book. You know, Christmas in Heaven is about the little boy and everything. So all you parents out there, go to the local parish bookstore. And if they don't have the book, tell them to make a call to Sophia, order 10 of them. All right. Put them on the shelves. And I promise you they're going to sell because Anthony is a best selling author. That means his books sell. Joe Resinello. Let's talk at the beginning of this book. You make a reference to purgatory. I thought that was interesting. Um, a lot of Catholics don't understand purgatory. They don't talk about it anymore. Um, along with buying this book, Christmas in Heaven, <clears throat> excuse me, you should buy uh, Faustina's Diary. It talks about a lot purgatory and mercy of God. Um, and to be honest, it made me think, I think it's a spiritual classic. And one day, they haven't called me yet, the Vatican, but I think she's going to become a doctor of the church. They don't, didn't call you? No, they they may. They may. <laughs> but that's my prediction. I'm going to play a little Joe Stradamus here. I think she'll become a doctor of the church. But with, with, <laughs> with that said, um, you do know purgatory in this book. Why? Interesting. Yeah. Heaven, purgatory, they go together. Sure. Well, I didn't want to give the impression just because this is a book about heaven that I don't believe in purgatory. Purgatory is a doctrine of the church. It's been a doctrine of the church from the beginning. It's based on the fact that, as Revelation 21 says, nothing unclean can enter heaven. The fact is that there are people who have died, who have been saved by Christ, but still have on their souls some stain of sin that has already been forgiven. And sometimes these souls also might have an attachment to those sins that have been forgiven. Purgatory is the place where we get cleaned up of those uh, imperfections so that we could see God face to face without any shame or guilt or attachment to what is unholy. That's a doctrine of the church. Look, if you were going to meet the president or the pope uh, tonight, or you were going to attend a wedding party of some kind, you would presumably wash your hair and comb your, you know, and, and brush your teeth and, and change out of your, your, your gym clothes. Well, heaven's the biggest party of all, and we're going to meet the most important person of all time, the Lord. So purgatory is the place where we get cleaned up for that. You know, we've all been to Catholic funerals where uh, the speakers uh, tend to eulogize and canonize the deceased person. And, and you know, I'm sympathetic to that because it's a time of mourning, but we never want to deprive the person who has died of the benefit of our prayers because they very well may need those prayers if they're still in purgatory. So, I, I, so while I didn't want to dwell on purgatory in this book because it's a book about heaven, uh, I did want to include mention of it and give a little note to parents to help them explain to children, especially if they're a little older, uh, what purgatory is. No, absolutely. The book is Christmas in Heaven. So obviously the boy's grandmother dies. So let's stay on. I, I just want to tell you a funny little story. I love your comments, Anthony, because you, you you triggered a thought in my head. Um, you, you're familiar with um, Regina Pacha's, uh Parish in Brooklyn, sure. right? Oh, yeah. yeah. So when we were living there, when, after my wife and I got married, that's where we were living. So because she was still going to school in Brooklyn. Anyway, so I would go over to Regina Pachas, which, by the way, is now a minor basilica. Um, and My brother been... was married there. My brother was married in that show. Incredible. Oh, okay. I loved I, I, I loved that parish. But the but uh, just along the lines of what you're saying, you know, everybody got mad uh, at Monsignor, Monsignor Marino there, right? I remember him giving a, a, a homily, talking about death, talking about our disposition at a, at a funeral mass. And people being more concerned about talking about grandma, she made the best meatballs, or or grandpa was a great pinochle player, rather than focusing on what are we doing here? What are we doing? We're supposed to be, we, we're talking about the theological virtue of hope. So we have hope that that person's in heaven. We're, we're supposed to be praying for that person. The mass, of course, is about Jesus Christ. Uh, a lot of it gets kind of like, you know, we, 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 we forget sometimes, or we get a little complacent. You know, it's like you said, nobody, nobody just dies and goes to heaven. I mean, ve or very few. 
you know, like, like, you know, you can't imagine Mother Teresa in purgatory. But I'm, I think you know where I'm going. I, I'm, yeah. I'm, I, I'm sorry to sound critical, but I, I wish people would understand. Person dies, you're in a Catholic church. You need to be praying for their soul. That's what's important. Yeah, it is, and you can do both. You know, you can do both depending on how. You, especially if you're talking to children, uh, you don't want to scare them. You know about the. You know, and so you don't want to talk to them about the fire of purgatory. Let's say <laughs> they're too young to understand that. You may want to concentrate as a, in a past way on what heaven is about. If the child is older, though, then they could understand about washing up before going to a party and they need to wash up before going to heaven. There are ways to do this. You know, but 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 purgatory, I think, is easy to explain to children. And I think heaven is also easy to explain to children. You know, people sometimes get scared of talking about heaven to kids. And, and when you think about it, it's very easy for kids to understand. Heaven is just God's home. When people die, uh, and those people love God, and if they're not in purgatory, they go to live in God's home. They just move homes. Right. They go from their home here on earth to God's home in heaven. And that's something all children can understand because they all children go to their grandparents' houses and their aunt's apartment, or they go to, to a different building uh, to go to school. They understand the concept of moving from place to place. So the more we're able to show children how wonderful a place heaven is, the more co consolation they'll experience when they're grieving and 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 they know about their loved ones moving to that place. absolutely anthony let me stay if you don't mind let me stay on uh hope for a second okay um because we're interested and remember if you're just joining us here at the front line with joe and joe the book is christmas in heaven uh we have the author anthony de stefano we're proud to say a friend of our show um how does the book itself help help strengthen the theological virtue of hope. I think, because I went off on a little bit of a tangent earlier about no, hope, but I do okay. want to focus on, because your books are designed and written to, to help us as Catholics, not just kids, adults too. Talk about that. I, I never shy away from talking about death, even in children's books, because it's something that all of us, uh, including children, have to deal with. We have to deal with death of loved ones at some point. Children grieve over the death of pets, they grieve over the death of grandparents, and they experience many kinds of personal, of permanent loss as well, even moving to a different neighborhood or going to a different school. Those feelings of loss can hurt. And it's very important that we don't sweep those sad feelings uh, uh, under the rug, because those feelings, they don't go away. They don't disappear. What happens to them, they, they grow. They fester, they transform into, into complexes and depressions and phobias and all kinds of psychological problems. Fortunately, as Christians, as I said, we believe that death doesn't have the final word. The final word is, is resurrection in heaven and, and life everlasting. And that's a, a tremendously consoling belief that could help us deal with grief and death in a healthy way. That's the whole point. We don't want to turn a blind eye to the, I mean, the, we can't protect our kids from suffering. This world is full of suffering. I don't care how joyful you are as a Christian, this world will always be uh, a place of sorrow, a valley of tears and a place of sorrow until we get to the other side. So you're not going to be able to protect your kids from that. The best way to, to help them deal with it is to talk to them about heaven and the fact that we have the final victory. This way that when, when, when life does hit them with a two by four, they'll be able to deal with it in a hopeful way. No, absolutely. And we mentioned to everyone out there, a uh, book that we're talking about, Christmas in Heaven, obviously is available, Barnes & Noble, Amazon, but we might prefer you buy it from the publisher or talk to your local parish bookstore and have them order a few copies, put it on the shelves. Um, Anthony, any, uh, do you have a website, social media, any of that fun stuff? Yes, I do. If they, if your uh, viewers don't mind my uh, long Italian name, it's www.anthonydestefano.com. I do not sell my books on that website. I don't hawk books or anything like that. But you can see all of my books there and get more information on them and see video book readings and things like that. Okay, awesome. Joe Racinello, we have probably a couple of minutes before the break, so we could start a topic. I just want to talk a little bit about heaven briefly and then get Anthony's comments. Heaven, like we have to work on sanctifying ourselves. People don't talk about that enough. Um, we talked a little bit about that with regard to purgatory, but we do that now. Uh, like, you know, like 
talk about that, Anthony, because I, I don't know, even Catholics, like, you know, uh, I remember uh, just a quick story. I went to confession years ago with Andrew Apostoli, and he was like famous. Uh, and I was like a young guy. He scared the hell out of me. I'm going to be honest with you. <laughs> and he was just like, you don't want to go to purgatory. And he gave me a Fatima prayer. He was a big Fatima guy. He was just like, you want to do your like, you know, like sanctification here. I was just like, here I am talking to, like, you know, he's like a famous priest and he's like scaring the crap out of me. I'm going to be honest with you. <laughs> Talk about that. Like just in terms of working out your sanctification here. <laughs> Well, it's hard to talk about it because I'm busy trying to do just that myself. <laughs> and I have this very, very strong feeling that I'm going to be spending a great deal of time in purgatory. Uh, in fact, I'm going to write a book on purgatory. You know, believe it or not, I've written a book on heaven. I've written a book on hell. And I'm scheduled to write a book on purgatory next year because I myself want to get to the bottom of it more. But yes, the job of, of this, you know, think about it. Heaven is for all eternity. We cannot wrap our minds around the concept of eternity. You know, in comparison to eternity, the, the, the 50, 60, 70, 80, 90 years of life we have on this planet is absolutely nothing. Uh, so, so, but, but yet, even though it's absolutely nothing in terms of, of the scope of our lives in heaven, it's so, so important because what we do here uh, is gonna determine what happens for all eternity. So we have a precious little time to to make sure that we get to heaven and that we get uh, that when we get to heaven, we we uh, experience the most joy possible because there are different levels of happiness in heaven. You know, uh, I remember, you know, the story about St. Therese of the Sioux. She asked her sister who happened to be uh, who happened to become a nun. How can someone how can we all be perfectly happy in heaven? And yet, you know, there are some you know, saints who are very, very great saints, and then there are little teeny saints. How could they all be so perfectly happy? And her sister took three glasses, a very big glass, uh, a, a, a medium-sized glass, and like a small shot glass. She filled them all up with water to the top. And she said, look, all of these glasses are completely full, aren't they? That's the way people are in heaven. There are little saints, there are medium saints, and there are big, giant, glorious saints like Mother Teresa. Every single one of them is as happy as they could possibly be. But there are those who are bigger saints who have more capacity for joy. And what we're doing here in this life is we're trying to, we're like glass blowers. We're trying to make ourselves bigger glasses so that when we get to heaven, we can be bigger and bigger and take more and more of God's, God's joy into us. Because God is infinite. But the bigger, the, the, the bigger our souls are, the, the more capacity we have to, to have more joy in heaven. So that's really the point of our life on earth, to expand our souls so that we can have more joy in heaven. Absolutely. We're gonna take, Anthony, we're gonna take a quick break. Um, if you're just joining us here at the front line with Joe and Joe, please stick around. We're discussing Anthony's new book, Anthony DiStefano's new book, Christmas, Christmas in Heaven is available. It's a the press. There will be a link in the description. You could click on that. You get a discount for knowing Joe and Joe. Uh, hit up your local parish bookstore. Have them order a few copies. Put it on the shelves. We know it's going to sell. Uh, so uh, we're, we're going to come back uh, and uh, and have another segment with Anthony. So stick around. Don't go anywhere. Welcome back, everyone, to the front line with Joe and Joe. Joe Pasillo, Joe Rosillo, way in the breach with a good friend of the show. Anthony DiStefano, and we are discussing his new book, Christmas in Heaven. It's available at Sophia Press. Click the link in the description and make sure you uh, you get a discount on that or hit up your local Fresh bookstore and ask them if, uh, you know, or recommend to them that they order a few copies and put it on the shelf. I'm about to kick off this, uh, this segment because uh, we're big. We, you know, Joe and I, Anthony, we, and we, we've alluded to it already in our conversation in the first segment, right? But I re really want to hone in for a second on Saints, Okay. Um, because I think sometimes, even as Catholics, we 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 know who the saints are. You know, like we, we, especially Italians, every we everybody knows Saint Gerard and you know Santa Lucia and uh, you know and all this, right? But how important, just conceptually, how is it important is it? Uh, and you focus on saints in your book, in this book, Christmas in Heaven. Okay, you I mentioned do. a couple of them: Saint Martha, Saint Francis. Okay, how important is a it is it for us to remember that when we're in heaven, we're saints. And that, right. that is the goal, 
You talked about sanctification. You talked about purgatory. You talked about having the capacity for God. Okay. Talk about the importance, not just for children, but also for adults to recognize striving for sainthood. Sure. Well, the, there's only one goal in life, and that's to become a saint. And there's only one failure in life, not to become a saint. That's what it all comes down to. Uh, your life is a meaningless failure. If you make $10 billion and then do not become a saint, then you've had a, a miserable, horrible life. If you die at 10 years old uh, with absolutely nothing, but you go to heaven, then you're a saint. And then you've had a wonderful life, a marvelous life. A saint is just someone who's made it to heaven. Now in Catholic theology, uh, saints uh, are people who have lived lives of uh, heroic virtue and they are canonized, so we know that they are in heaven. But there are a lot of folks who are not canonized, like maybe grandma or grandpa or, or other good people, who are still in heaven, and those people are saints as well. And they are models of faith for us. The lives of the, faith, of the saints serve as examples of how to live our gospel in the daily life across different times and cultures and, and professions. You know, we have Jesus Christ, of course, as a role model, but he lived in Palestine 2,000 years ago. Uh, what the saints teach us is how would Jesus Christ have been if he was a doctor in the 18th century? How would Jesus Christ have been if he was a lawyer? How would Jesus Christ have been if he was, you know, um, uh, uh, working in the slums of India? You know, what would Jesus Christ be like then? How could he be as a writer, say, in the, in the 21st century? That when you have this, when you are able to study the lives of the saints, you see Christ-like people in different circumstances and different situations, and that's what shows us um, the gives us the inspiration for Christians in all walks of life. Uh, and shows them that holiness is attainable no matter what the circumstance. And of course, another uh, reason why it's important for us to know the saints is because they're our friends. You know, they can intercede for us with God. They're closer to our God. To, to God than our family and friends and strangers are here on earth. So their prayers are very effective. Now, our Protestant brothers and sisters often misunderstand this. They think that when we pray to the saints, we're praying to the saints as if the saints are idols, okay? But they're not. We're really just praying to the saints to ask them to pray for us. We're asking them to intercede for us. And Protestants understand the concept of intercessory prayer very well. They ask people to pray for them all the time. What we Catholics do is, we just make it wider and richer. We include the saints in heaven because they're closer to God than we are. Right. I mean, I, I, I've tried to explain the concept of the communion of saints uh, to, to, to Protestants. Yes, it's, it, they're my friends. If, I, if I'm praying to St. Benedict, it's because St. Benedict is my friend. He wants me to be in heaven. Why would I always go back to the same thing, though, Anthony, and I'm going to hand it over to Joe. Bottom line is this. When the at the wedding feast of Cana, there's your model, not just for our view on Mary, but also our view on the saints. The people, the host of the wedding party, Jesus is sitting right there. He could go directly to Jesus. We hear that all the time. I just go to directly. Well, they could have gone directly to Jesus. Instead, they went and asked his mama. Say, could you go talk to your son? That's what we do with Mary when we ask her to pray for us. That's what we do with the saints. Because because that's that's God's model from the beginning to save us through us. OK, of course, God could have just waved a magic hand and saved us. OK, but he be, was born a human being, a, a, a human, a human. So so it's always been his plan for us to help each other. That's part of the, the this beautiful concept of the communion of saints. And Protestants get it when it comes to asking each other for prayers. They understand. They just sometimes get, they, sometimes, you know, they'll point to scriptures that say, you know, do not pray to the dead. And they're misunderstanding those scriptures because what those scriptures are prohibiting is conjuring up the dead. And Catholics too have prohibit, you know, are not allowed to do that. We can't have seances, mm -hmm. try to contact the dead. We don't do that. All we're doing is asking those saints, like we ask our fellow Christians here on earth, to pray for us. Very simple. Absolutely. Uh, Joe Racinello, where do you want to go? I just want to expand on that because I don't think people like when they people talk about saints, they think it's like unattainable. Vatican II calls us all to be saints. And why do I bring this up? It's the most efficacious thing you can do for the world. Like high achieving people, and I'm not knocking high achieving people, to be honest with you, to a degree, I kind of am one of them. I strived my whole life, worked hard. I did everything I was quote unquote supposed to do. Um, and that's good. But 
it pales in comparison to a holy life. If we prioritize holiness, we will set the world on fire. Every single one of us, whether you have a third grade education and you live in the jungles of Amazon, or you're the smartest person on earth, you're Elon Musk, you will set the world on fire. And I'll be honest with you, Anthony, I said this to Joe Pasillo. Um, when we took on the show, I was like, dude, we have to pray. Like, Every, like, you know, we have a, a rudimentary, you know, understanding of the faith. You know, we didn't go to the Gregorian, but we're fairly well read. And, you know, we have some understanding. I'm not going to say, you know, we're the smartest people in the, you know, out there. But that does not, that's not what makes the show. We have to become holy. We have to pray. If you're married, you have to pray. You want to do a good job as a husband. And, you know, I do my best, you know, like, and, and as a dad. You got to pray. It all comes down to being holy. Holy people shake the foundations of the world because you look at the lives of the saints and they did. How does Padre Pio, he lives on a hill in Southern Italy. It's it's like no man's land. It's it's like people to this day, they go there. Like, like why would you go there? Why would you go to Calcutta? It's not exactly Disneyland. But people go because one holy person was there. We can do that. It's within our grasp. And I don't think people think in those terms. I try to because I look at the lives of the saints. I've read a lot about them. They shake the found Catherine of Siena, one of 24 kids. She counseled the Pope. She was like to the Pope, you're in France. Go back to Rome. And he did. Who? Oh, how does that happen? You know what I'm saying? Like, because she was holy. We can do that. Talk about that. Because well, I don't think people, I mean, you know, like, I, they don't, you know, I, I, I uh, use myself as an example again, not that I'm holy because I, <laughs> I'm not, I strive for it, but I, um, I fall a lot, you know? <laughs> oh, so do I, Anthony. But, but, but the thing is though, when I was a kid, I didn't go to Catholic school. We grew up in Brooklyn. There was, you know, it was it was not a particularly religious uh, home that I grew up in. Um, only one person, my sister, went to church. But like in many other cases, that one person is enough to 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 eventually dread, you know, bring everybody else along. I wasn't particularly. I didn't. I didn't have a creative mind. I, in fact, I used to. My father had a very creative mind. Used to tell us bedtime stories, and I thought I didn't have any creative gene in my whole body because I couldn't come up with stories. Sometime in my 20s, I became committed to my faith again. And I made a con I consecrated myself to Jesus through Mary, you know, using that formula of St. Louis de Montfort. And again, I wasn't particularly holy at the time, but I prayed to be a right. I prayed that God would send me ideas, that Mary would help me, that the saints would help me. After all, God is the author of life. Mary is the mother of the author of life. So I said that prayer. You know, author of life, mother of the author of life, help me. I want to write books. And since my since that time that I did that, I've written 30 books, children's but then the, and 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 I'm not bragging, but yes, some of them have become huge bestsellers. And I don't I don't know where it all come came from. I've got five books coming out this year. And I'm not that bright. I mean, I'm really not the brightest bulb in the bunch. And yet I have five books coming out. How could it be? I pray every night that God will give me ideas, that he'll give me. So it, yeah, the, the, the power of prayer and the power of uh, uh, Our Lady as well and the saints to help us I, is something that- You know, I, I want to just share something. I want to just share something personal with you both. I never even told Joe this. Like over Lent, I did something a little extra this past year. Um, I, I don't want to say what, but a little bit more of a pinch. And I do spiritual readings every morning. And I started to write reflections and to, I'm not a writer. I get like, you know, my blog has 450,000 views and, and I'm a nobody. Um, I say that because when I write that, I swear in the morning, I don't even know what I'm going to write. Sometimes when I turn on the computer, it flows through me. That sounds weird. Like, like, like you might think that's crazy. Someone listening to this, like they'll say, you're crazy. Well, I am, but, but at the same time, like it flows through me, like, like I, I, it takes me longer to proofread it than to write it because, and it's a fruit of 
what I did that Lent. And, and that's real. Like, I don't know if people think like that. They should. Like, because everything comes down to what you just said and what I just said. If we do that groundwork, God will, maybe you won't write. Maybe you'll do something else. Maybe you'll make a movie. Maybe you, you'll you feed a billion people. I don't know. You'll do something. And because that's real. You know what I mean? Like, does that, like, I, like it, when you were telling that to me, because I'm not a writer, to be honest with you, but I, I it just flows out of me. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It it, it comes from God. Uh, it's right there in the Bible. You know, there are plenty of plenty of verses where 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 uh, uh, Jesus tells tells the apostles, "Don't worry about what you're going to say. The Holy Spirit will give you the words." You know, you know. In this atheistic secular society of ours, we we continually treat God as if he's a question. Does God exist? And we'll argue that and debate that question. We treat him as a question instead of asking him a question. If you're an atheist or you're an agnostic, instead of treating God as a question, ask him a question. Say, God, show me you exist. God, help me with these things. These, show me what I'm supposed to do. Show me my destiny. Show me what I'm supposed to do. I have this great urge to be this. Well, show me. Sometimes your dream is not your destiny, you know, but God will point you in the right, right direction and through trial and error, he'll push you along and life will be a tremendous adventure. It has been for me. You know, I wanted to be a doctor growing up, you know, and that didn't work at some little things on the way, like organic chemistry and uh, <laughs> calculus. Uh, uh, but then I became a writer and I realized that I, I, that, that I didn't want to be a doctor. I wanted to be a healer, but I only understood that, that I could heal people with writing after I started praying, before I started praying, I just had my own faulty, interpret ignorant interpretations of God's will. But when you pray, he begins to make his will manifest to you. I think I, I did that so right. I, I just from my own personal experience, Anthony DiStefano joining us here at the front line with Joe and Joe, um, looking back on my life. I could never the, the path that I've been on for the last 20 years or let's say 18 years. I, I, I would I would never, never have, have guessed which way I, I, I was going. Never. I mean, it, it just, but once I, I mean, in my, in my own, and again, we, we all fall short sometimes of uh, trusting completely in God, but even then, because I was praying constantly, God just moved it along. I look back at it in hindsight, I go, really? <laughs> like, like, that's the plan. I would have been on it in a million years, but the, the book is Christmas in heaven and the, the publisher, Sophia press, uh, so we would always encourage you to buy, click the link in the description and buy the book from uh, Sophia Press. And uh, you'll get a you'll get a small discount, 15 percent discount for buying the book there. You could also buy the book at Barnes and Noble, Amazon, or you could get your hit up your local uh, Catholic bookstore and ask them to buy, order a few copies and put it on their shelves. And the author is with us here today, Anthony DiStefano. So let's. um. Well, I, well, let's stay on the book for a second, just physically the book itself. So. A lot of illustrations, I'm assuming, because all your books uh, are, are illustrated beautifully. Uh, talk about the illustrations, the illustrator. Is it the same one you've been using? Uh, I always try to use different illustrators. It depends on what I'm trying to accomplish in the book. I don't want all my books to have the same look. The illustrator of this book is a wonderful uh, Catholic lady named Bernadette Carstensen. She's a very well-known Catholic artist. I think the National Catholic Register did a big profile in profile on her a couple of years ago. She's done many church altarpieces and religious paintings. And, um, you know, I wanted an artist for this book who knew their faith uh, and who knew something about the saints and who uh, could portray the saints doing things that they were famous for doing. But I also wanted someone who, who could create a happy book, a colorful book, sort of with vintage style illustrations like Norman Rockwell. That was what I was going for in this book. And I wanted someone who could be a little whimsical, uh, who, who wasn't afraid of being playful and having a sense of humor so that the pictures could not only be poignant and Christmassy and beautiful, but also fun. Because as we've been saying, you know, we want to show that that heaven is a, is a happy place. So the illustrations have to be happy too. And I think Bernadette Carson said did a uh, fantastic job. Awesome. Thanks for that, Anthony. Joe Racinello. Let's talk the first Christmas. Jesus, Mary, and Joseph, they're in a barn, probably more historically accurate they're in a cave you know for those you know who really study ancient you know scriptures um 
The poor are there, the rich are there. I always think about that when I put my nativity set up. You know, you have the poor shepherds. Obviously, the star guided them all, you know, but that doesn't happen in life. Let's be honest. We're, we're kind of cliquish, tribal as a people. Christ brought the two extremes of society together. He still does that today. I mean, if you look at the 12 apostles, you have Matthew, who was basically, he was a traitor to his own people and a Jew. And then you have Simon the Zealot, which means, Zealot means he was a revolutionary which means he would hate Matthew, hate him. He'd be like, you're a traitor, but he didn't. Christ brought them together. He could do that to the world today if we allow him to. Talk about that first Christmas, how Jesus sure. brought everyone together. Sure, sure. And it's not just the poor and the rich that he brought together who are represented because <clears throat> the uh, it also represents the Israelites uh, who were the shepherds and the Gentiles. Because they were the kings were from the east, and it, and it also represents the simple people and the scholars. Because the the shepherds were simple people, and the and the and the kings were wise men. So so there's a whole. The idea is there's a whole cross section of the world that's present here at the nativity, and it's a prophecy and a sign of what's to come in the future. And, and what the Bible says that uh, that at some point every knee uh, will bend at the name of Christ the Lord. So. Um, you know, in terms of, you know, what we have to do today, of course, you know, one of the, the, the Christ's last great prayer was that we be one. That's what he prayed at the pa before the passion, that we be one. And there's so much, obviously, the world is so polarized. I think we have to start in our own homes. It sounds so cliche, but if we want to reclaim Christmas and make, you know, Jesus the center of everything, uh, we have to do it uh, in the public square and in our own homes. We have to recognize that there's this culture war that's raging around us and, uh, and we have to fight in it. We have to go public and, and go in their faces when we're talking about fighting in, in the public square. And in terms of taking back these holidays for our families, we have to put Christ in the center of that by, by, by praying on the holidays, by going to church on the holidays, by, by having some catechesis in the home on these holidays. You know, we have to show these uh, the, the children that Christmas isn't just about uh, decorations and holidays and food and, and lights, as nice as those things are, but it, it, it's about Jesus Christ. As long as when we put Jesus Christ at the center, that's when he'll start making these miracles and bringing everyone together. And Stefano, let me stay on joy for a second. Help our audience out, okay? Because I think, again, talking about words, words get thrown around and sometimes I'm, my hand's raised. Uh, sometimes I get a little confused about, OK, but what are you talking about? Talk to talk to our audience, talk to Joe and I about what is the difference, truly the difference between real joy and what people call happiness or pleasure, because there is a distinct difference between those those three concepts. Uh, I'd love for you to flesh that out a little bit, because we're called, as you said, to be joyful. Yeah, well, <clears throat> pleasure is the easiest one of those concepts to understand. It's just something that makes us feel good. And it could be, and something good can make us feel good or something bad can make us feel good. Uh, and many times people mistake happiness for pleasure. And they be, in order to seek happiness, they just become hedonists. They go out and they, they, uh, they get as many pleasures as they can. Uh, and what happens? They wind up becoming uh, I I miserable. I mean, just look at Hollywood. You know, there you've got people who have achieved fame and they've achieved uh, money and they have uh, as much sex as they want. You know, every single kind of pleasure you can have in life, they have. And yet so many of them are committing suicide or um, become drug addicts or have broken marriages. So obviously, uh, pleasure isn't the key to happiness. A happiness and joy are often used uh, interchangeably. It's very hard. You have to look at the philosophy of uh, Aristotle and Thomas Aquinas to really start defining it. But, but uh, the joy, they, fundamentally, is a, a, lasting, some, a lasting feeling of contentness, satisfaction, that you are doing something meaningful and that you are doing something that is good in the eyes of God. The point is, it's lasting. It weathers every storm. Emotions go up and down. 
Emotions change uh, because you haven't eaten, because, uh, because the weather is, is bad, uh, because uh, someone said a nasty word to you. Uh, they go up and down like a roller coaster. You can't base your life on a roller coaster. Emotions change all the time. Uh, joy is something that lasts and is there even when things are going bad, even when, the, when, when there's a storm out, even when you're grieving, even when you're at a funeral, you still have this very deep uh, awareness uh, that you are living a meaningful life and, and that you are uh, being in union, in union with God. That's where joy comes from. And, and thank you for that, Anthony, because like I said, that's one of the things Joe and I <clears throat> try to do here on the show is, is, you know, because again, we don't just take what we hear for granted or, you know, we want to try to get into what things mean, particularly from a Catholic point of view. And I think for me anyway, in my experience, joy and happiness and pleasure always seem to get kind of commingled, which, you know, don't think and thank you for your explanation. They don't. Anthony DeStefano's joining us here at the front line with Joe and Joe. Joe, we probably have time for one more question for Anthony. Let's talk about giving, because obviously Christmas people give gifts, and that's a good thing. The three kings, they gave gifts, uh, you know, each of which were symbolic. But, you know, we can give not just at Christmas, but during the year. There's such joy in giving. I mean, if we even just look around our neighborhood, you know, there could be uh, an elderly man who lives alone because his wife died. If you make a little extra food on Sunday, knock on his door, give him some. There's such joy in that, in our heart gets full. Talk about just the joy found in giving. It's not just for Christmas. There's joy in giving because because when you're giving, you're in union with God. Uh, what is the definition of love? Love is the most abused, confused, misused, uh, overused word in the, in the human language. Uh, we use the word love for, 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 uh, for, for anything. We love, our, we love our shoes. We love this ice cream. We love this person. You know, we use this one word for everything, but love really only has one meaning, and that's sacrificial self-giving doing what's best for the other person. This is the kind of love Jesus taught at the Last Supper. He said, this is my body given up for you. We don't cling to our bodies. We don't cling to ourselves. We give it away. And that's what Jesus did on the cross. He gave himself away. That's what God the Father did when he emptied himself and, and, and his son became uh, human in the incarnation. It all has to do with giving away. When you give away, you are manifesting the very being, the very substance of God. So naturally, you're going to be joyful because joy, because God is joy. He's happiness. Uh, and, and, and if we're being like him by giving ourselves away, we too are going to tap into that joy that he is. Absolutely. So, Anthony, that's a great place to wrap up the conversation. Uh one more time, Ant. We're uh, we're you have a website. Give our audience uh, any information about where they can find out more about you and and your past books and anything you've got going on. Sure, www.anthonydestefano.com. You could find out all about all the pictures of my books are there. The video readings of those books are there, and my books are very. I'm very blessed. They're very widely available at Amazon, Barnes and Noble, Sophia Institute Press, EWTN, Catholic stores, Christian bookstores, wherever books are sold. And that's awesome. The book in question, and for this conversation out there, is Christmas in Heaven. Um, and the author, Anthony DiStefano, as I said, proud. Joe and I are proud to say he's a friend of the show, and uh, we would encourage you to go out and buy the book. But if you want to get a little discount, click the link in the description, um, and uh, you'll get a 15% discount because you know Joe and Joe. Anthony DiStefano, as always, it's such a pleasure speaking to you. Um, and, and listen, real quick. Now, you said you have a book on purgatory coming out next year. Are you working on anything in the interim, or is that the project? Well, I, I've, I've got a book on the Eucharist for Children coming out uh, in a, before First Communions next year called From Bread and Wine to Saints Divine. A, an adult book, a miracle book, a simple book in the, the impossible, and that's for adults. I've got a book called the, on, on, on the True Meaning of Halloween called All Hallows' Eve coming out, and a book called The Sparrow. So, a wonderful, right? I so, hope you're, so. you're stuck like Chuck. Anthony, we go. Thanks again, brother. We really appreciate it. Thank you. And 
You're welcome. And thank you all out there for joining us at the Veritas Catholic Radio Network, 1350 on your AM dial, 103.9 on your FM dial, spreading the truth of the Catholic faith to the New York City metropolitan area. Download the app, share it with your friends. You'll have access to all of our station's content. And Joe and I are all over social media, Rumble X, Facebook, YouTube, where you see our content, where you see this video, this interview with Anthony. Please like, subscribe, share, share, share. Let's get the word out there. And remember, until the next time, that our conversation is your conversation and that conversation is going on everywhere we'll talk to you soon